Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to CG. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us here tonight. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about cybersecurity. We're going to talk about who's watching. We're going to talk about surveillance, treachery, and trust online. We have a very, very distinguished group of speakers this evening, and it's my honor to be able to introduce them to you tonight. Uh, Fen Hampson will be one of our will be one of our our, our speakers. Fen is a distinguished fellow here at CG. He's also the director of our Global Security and Politics Program. In addition to that, he's a Chancellor's Professor at Carleton University in Ottawa. Prior to that, quite a, quite a distinct honor, he served as the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. And I was just speaking with a, a Monk uh, Center graduate uh, earlier this evening, and I'm on the board of the Ball Silly School of International Affairs, so I, I mean this with all sincer sincerity. Uh, when I say NIPSI is the best graduate school of international affairs in the country because I'm also a graduate there too. Uh, no, but more seriously, under his leadership, uh, NIPSIA it already had a stellar reputation, uh, but Fen catapulted NIPSIA uh, into uh, the, stellar, uh, the stellar area that it is now. Uh, he was uh, just a very distinguished leader of that august institution. He also holds a PhD from Harvard University. Um, he is a, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's authored 10 books, co-authored uh, co 26 uh, volumes in international affairs. He's written more than 100 articles and book chapters in international affairs. So when I think of somebody who's a successful scholar, I would say this, if they wrote a quarter as much as Fenn, half as well, they'd be a distinguished professor. So Fenn is, to say that he's prolific, I think would be, to, would be an understatement. Um, he uh, is a frequent media commentator, you've probably seen seen him on TV before. If I want to know where Fenn is on any given day, I just turn on the CBC or read the Globe. Um, but uh, in addition to that, and pr pr partly what brings him here, is he was uh, the, the co-director of the Global Commission on Internet Governance. Uh, this was a major uh, pr undertaking that CG did with Chatham House uh, in the UK to look at the future of the internet and how we choose to govern our, ourselves online. Um, and Fed, Fen is a big thinker, uh, and he's, he's uh, famous for big ideas, and this was, w this was one, of, uh, one of those moments where Fen came up with a really, really interesting project and pushed it to fruition. And that actually brings me to our other speaker, Eric, because it's through the Global Commission on Internet Governance on the Future of Internet that we got to meet Eric. So Eric Jardine is a, is a fellow here at CG, and he's also an assistant professor of political science at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. He joined CG in 2014, and what was interesting about Eric is his background's actually counterinsurgency and the real hard security stuff. So Eric joined us to work on this internet, on, on, on technology, and he, he didn't know a lot about it. And internet governance is known for an alphabet soup of, al, uh, uh, of acronyms, ICANN, IANA, all sorts of things. And we, I made a joke to him. I said, you know, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a handle on the alphabet soup in no time. Two years later, he's one of the rising stars in the field. So this is, the type of, uh, this is the type of caliber of speaker you're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, these gentlemen together wrote um, Look Who's Watching, where they, they, they take a, a hard look at some of the most challenging and uh, issues in, in public policy as it relates to technology, the deep web, cyber warfare, and the Internet of Things. But if you've been to CG's lectures before, we're going to be switching it up a little. So usually we have a speaker or two, but we're going to have Fen and Eric come up and talk about some of the themes in their book, and then we're going to bring up some industry experts to enlighten us as we have a, a panel discussion. And I had um, I had dinner earlier with with, this, with these speakers, and to say that we're uh, in the presence of some of the most knowledgeable people in the industry uh, here in Canada, I think would be an understatement. J. Paul Hines is going to be coming up. J. Paul is the president and CEO of eCentire. Uh, eCentire. Um, the, the bio says, uh, J. Paul was, was drawn to eCentire with a vision to create a disruptive cybersecurity company that delivers what is now referred to as managed detection and response. What these guys are are threat hunters. 
They go out where, where, where others wait for the threats to attack them. They go out and proactively look for threats. That company secures more than $5 trillion with an a, uh, worth of assets. And that was not a, a misstatement. I mean, $5 trillion with a T. One of the most successful cybersecurity companies uh, in, the, in the country. Um, he's a professional engineer with, 25, with a 25-year entrepreneurial track record of success um, and is one of the most reliable voices on the topic of cybersecurity in North America and Europe. Neil Desai will also be joining us. Neil is the Director of Corporate uh, Affairs Management, or Corporate Affairs at Magnet Forensics. Magnet Forensics is a really tremendously interesting company. Um, they're one of the fastest growing technology companies, and what they do is they, de they develop tools uh, to help police and security agencies around the world recover, analyze, and report on digital evidence for investigations into the really nasty stuff, into human trafficking, child exploitation, fraud, and terrorism. Um, he previously served in very senior roles in the government of Canada, uh, and we did an event with, uh, with Magnet Forensics uh, where one of these victims of, uh, of uh, human trafficking came uh, to tell her story, and just to know that those guys are out there doing everything they can on the tech side to combat it is, is certainly comforting. So we have a very, very distinguished panel this evening, uh, some of the smartest people that I've had a chance to chat with in a long time. But first, let's hear about this book. So, Fen, Eric, please join me on stage. Uh, Fen Hansen, Eric Jardine. Thanks very much uh, for turning out on a wet uh, winter's evening to uh, hear about the internet and things technical. And we're going to try to ensure that our conversation with you this evening is, uh, is not technical, but speaks to some of the major uh, political and regulatory issues that we're confronting as the internet uh, becomes uh, not only the, uh, the town square, but the hidden wiring of uh, the global economy. Uh, Eric and I are gonna talk uh, a bit about some of the themes in the book. Uh, we have 20 minutes to do that. Actually, after that very generous introduction, I think we have about 10 minutes to do that. <laughs> but, um, uh, and then uh, our co-panelists, uh, uh, Jay and uh, Neil will uh, join us for uh, what we hope will be a very spirited conversation that will continue what was a great conversation at dinner, and I, uh, like uh, Aaron, have learned a great deal uh, from, uh, from our uh, uh, co-panelists. So, um, I'm not sure this works. Um, we're going to talk about three things, uh, three themes in the book. Uh, the first is, why is the internet important? Uh, what are some of the threats, some of the security threats that exist today to realizing the Internet's uh, full uh, potential? And then finally, and this will really be part of our panel discussion, uh, what do we do about it? You know, there's no point telling you a problem and then having you all go home and have a sleepless night uh, worrying about the security of your cell phone or your computer uh, unless we give you some reassurance and some ideas about what uh, people like our co-panelists are doing to, uh, to address some of these challenges. The internet, uh, and this may be familiar to some of you, uh, and if it is, uh, I apologize if we're covering uh, old ground, but uh, we're experiencing what some have called the fourth industrial revolution right now. And it's, uh, it's a revolution of, uh, of electrons. Um, the uh, the data uh, that flows uh, across the internet. And um, it's uh, contributing uh, in a major way uh, to uh, the global economy of the 21st century. Uh, by some estimates, uh, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, the, uh, the volume of goods and services traded on the internet was uh, 4.2 trillion. And just to put that in perspective, that's bigger than the uh, entire gross domestic product of the German economy. Uh, and it's growing. Uh, uh, it's, the internet is not just simply a place where we trade emails. It's a place uh, now 
uh, where a lot of commerce takes place, uh, where uh, uh, international uh, businesses, uh, and not just big ones, but small ones, are selling their goods and services uh, online. Uh, the internet is absolutely critical uh, to the financial sector. Um, you know, your money sits in a bunch of electrons at TD Bank or Bank of Montreal. It does not sit in gold bullion in uh, Fort Knox or Fort Ottawa. Um, but the internet is still a system that's in its infancy. And the metaphor I would like to use is one of a tennis ball. Right now, the internet is about the size of a tennis ball, um, metaphorically speaking, not literally. Uh, but it's going to grow over the next 10 years. And it's going to grow to, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, an object that's about the size of the sun. That is the trajectory that we're on right now. And, um, and the reason for that is that, and I'm going to say a little bit more about it in a, a minute or two, but uh, everything is going to have an online presence. Right now, we have cell phones, we have computers that are hooked up to the internet, but there are a lot of objects, uh, physical objects, that are also being uh, wired. No surprise here to the citizens of Kitchener-Waterloo. The uh, ICT sector that uh, supports the internet is one of the uh, fastest growing employment sectors uh, in most economies in the world. Some 14 million people in OECD countries are employed in the ICT sector. Uh, there are a lot more who uh, are providing goods and services to the ICT sector. So the knock-on effect, the positive externalities that are coming from uh, uh, information uh, technologies that uh, support the working of the internet and all the things that go on is, uh, is rapidly growing. Uh, it's, um, it's critical for uh, competitiveness. Um, if, uh, if you're a small and medium-sized enterprise, uh, all the evidence now shows that if you have a strong presence online, which is to say you're selling your goods and services online, you're going to be much more competitive by several orders of magnitude than uh, those companies that are not online. Uh, and uh, we used to live in a world back in the 19th century or the 20th century of what are called multinational corporations. These were corporations that uh, had uh, foreign direct investment in many different countries. They employed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of employees. And that made them multinational. Well, today, you can employ perhaps 100 people, 200 people, and you can still be a multinational, which is to say selling your goods and services in different markets. And the reason for that is that you have an online presence. And that, that makes you no different from the very big companies. So the internet is, is leveling the, the giant titans, the corporate titans of the world as as everybody becomes, even the small companies become multinational uh, corporations. At the same time, what we're also seeing is the shrinking of global value chains as um, with innovations like 3D printing. Uh, if you uh, go and buy your shoes from uh, Adidas, uh, you can, uh, uh, in some markets now, have a 3D printer that will spit out that running shoe for you. It doesn't have to come from Taiwan or the Philippines. The data that goes into printing that shoe may well come from somewhere south of the border, somewhere across uh, the Pacific. But um, with these kinds of innovations that are taking place that are accompanying the internet revolution, we're going to be seeing a, a massive transformation in the way uh, the global economy works. Uh, and just to give you some idea of really what's happening, is that uh, we're now entering, or we have entered a world, in which globalization is not so much 
the movement of capital or labor across borders. It's the movement of data, bits and bytes of information that are the result of financial transaction flows, the, uh, the movie that you uh, download on Netflix. I know that's a dirty word in certain parts of the country now. But, um, uh, you know, if you look at um, the little chart on the right, uh, data flows are, that, that curve is just going up and up and up, while trade, uh, trade flows, uh, trade in uh, finance, financial flows, which are obviously subject to uh, the, the swings of uh, the global economy, uh, have more or less flatlined. So what the world is now trading in are bits and bytes of data that cross state boundaries uh, with, uh, with impunity. This world that we're moving to, into, the so-called world of the Internet of Things, where your toothbrush, your clothes, um, your car, your refrigerator, your house, the lights and switches in your house, are all going to be hooked up to the Internet so that you can manage them, and that's already happening in some places. Um, uh, that world is one that is going to have all kinds of vulnerabilities associated with it. And my good friend uh, and colleague, uh, Eric Jardine, is going to talk to you about it. Um, and you've got 10 minutes, if that. <laughs> Thank you, Fen. So I, as, as Fen sort of alluded, I guess I get to be the, uh, the bearer of bad news here, unfortunately, so don't shoot the messenger. This is not me doing this, this is just sort of me talking about what is sort of happening on the flip side, because with all of the expansion of di digital infrastructure, our increasing reliance on digital devices, comes a concomitant vulnerability. And that's sort of what Fen, I think, was alluding to. And so the numbers up on the screen sort of, I think, go do well to sort of highlight the sort of situation we find ourselves in right now, the situation we might find ourselves in in the very, very near future. And it sort of points to the sort of flip side to that exponential trend that Fran was pointing to, which is a really rapid growth in the sort of negative consequences of interconnectivity. And so in 2016, some estimates put the, uh, the sort of scope of global cybercrime at around, say, $500 million. By 2019, that, uh, that is estimated to have increased to maybe around 20 mil, uh, 20, or sorry, $2 trillion, uh, again with a T, as Aaron said. And that number is likely to increase going forward as more devices and more data gets generated and sort of connected to the device. The Internet Society, which is a fairly major uh, non-governmental organization in this space, estimates that upwards of 45% of people already have started to change the way in which they behave online. That one of the unique features of the internet to date has sort of been its generative quality. The ability to do stuff on there, to innovate on top of the platform, that's really been what's driving this expansion of uh, the internet into everything and the expansion of the economy that's come along with it. And we've already started to see, as I said, upwards of 45% of individuals starting to change that behavior. What they would normally like to do, they're not doing. And they're not doing it because they're worried about issues to do with cybercrime. And that, I think, is a problem. And so in the information security spaces or cyber security space, there's really three forms of attack that we can, or three forms of compromise that we can talk about for information systems. One is attacks that target the accessibility of data. And I'll get into a little bit about what I mean by that in a second. Another is uh, attacks that target the confidentiality of data. And the third type is ones that target the integrity of data. And so as I said, I'll run through each of these and sort of unpack what they mean with some examples. But really, this triangle sort of sums up our data-driven universe, potentially with a plus authentication on the side that we can talk about a little bit maybe later on. So on the, uh, on the uh, accessibility front, I think a classic example of this would be uh, ransomware attacks. Last year, there was a fairly large ransomware attack called WannaCry, which many people in the room may have heard of, many people in the room might have even fallen prey to. And what these ransomware attacks essentially do is infect your computer or digital dev or your device with a malware that essentially encrypts your files and locks you out of the system. You then get a screen similar to this one on the side here, basically saying, we've encrypted your device. If you want your data back, please pay us 300 Bitcoin at that address. If you don't pay within the allotted time indicated on the side there, well, They'll send you a second notice that basically ups the price. 
If you don't pay then, they'll basically throw away the keys. You're not getting access to your data back. And so this form of attack essentially targets the, uh, the accessibility of the information stored on your device. And WannaCry is, I think, a great example because it sort of shows this sort of substitution away from other forms of attack towards this kind of behavior because WannaCry was very, very effective. It ended up affecting 150 countries globally over the span of basically a weekend. And it ended up affecting, as well, upwards of 200,000 organizations and individuals. Now, the really, the really uh, malicious part of all this is that many of those organizations were actually hospitals, especially in the United Kingdom. That these, were, these organizations were running Windows XP, which is, generally speaking, a pretty bad idea, but this is what they were using. And so their systems were locked out, which meant that their ability to provide services to people who are obviously in pretty bad shape was materially affected by the spread of this ransomware. So you have both an, a short run of, uh, monetary cost on individuals as well as a more long-term uh, or serious consequence if it affects organizations providing essential services. Another form of attack that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with and definitely people in this room have been affected by are attacks targeting the confidentiality of data. So this is anything that hits your credit card information, your debit information, your email, your phone number, uh, your social security number, anything of that sort. I have, just for illustrative purposes, a list of major data breaches by year, and you can sort of tell that the numbers are massive, so we're talking about millions of people per breach, easily, and they sort of seem to be sort of demonstrating a, a gradually escalatory trend where you have uh, the Yahoo breaches reaching into the millions, although those, although those happened a couple of years earlier, but you have millions of, to billions of records that are being compromised on a pretty routine basis. And these are all sort of targeting, as I said, the confidentiality of information. We don't have a problem with sharing or storing information on, uh, on someone's cloud services or on someone's device if they have legitimate cause to access that information. So if it's a healthcare provider, sure, they can have access to our health records. But it's when others gain access to it that it violates this confidentiality principle, and that creates a big problem. The third type of attack is our attacks that target the integrity of information that are stored on these systems. Now, this is the kind of attack that is sort of a bit, in some ways, the real nightmare scenario. Because one of the concomitant trends with what Fenn was talking about is not just an increase in data and an increase in connectivity, but an increase in our reliance on data to make decisions. So this is happening across the ecosystem everywhere from machine learning algorithms that you know, come up with uh, predictive al algorithms for crime through, um, well, pretty well anything. Consumer analytics, data analytics within firms, they're all reliant on data at their core. Now, these integrity-based attacks, what they do is they mess with that data. And so there's two, like, I think, prime examples that can really uh, sort of highlight what we're talking about here. One is the infamous Stuxnet attack, which targeted Iranian nuclear reactors. What this essentially did was get onto the, uh, the reactor system, which was uh, a feat in and of itself, because there was air gaps and other security measures put into place, but it got on the system. And what it was able to do from that vantage point was start to mess with th the data. And it did that in two different ways. First, it started to change the speed with which the centrifuges in the reactor were spinning. And like we, all, we can all probably sort of fathom what would happen here, but if you speed something up to its maximum speed and then you slam on the brakes, you're going to cause excessive wear and tear. And so at the, Natanz reactor in, in, at the Natanz reactor in Iran, you actually had them burning through around 9,000 centrifuges because the data was being sort of spoofed by the malware and told to do things that it wasn't supposed to be doing because it wasn't actual uh, genuine orders coming from the control room. The other uh, way in which integrity was compromised in this particular attack, which was quite innovative and malicious at the same time, was that the malware was feeding incorrect data back to the scientists in the control room. So they weren't in the reactor looking at the centrifuges spinning around. They were sitting looking at screens basically saying, why are all these things breaking? And all of the readouts that they were getting were basically saying, everything's fine. There is no problem. And so they were sort of, it took a while to figure out what was going on because they were, they were trusting the information that was coming across the system, but that information was being spoofed. The integrity of the information and the data was being compromised. You have other similar attacks that have targeted uh, Ukrainian power grids over the last two Christmases, and those attacks are basically a, a variant of the similar thing. They're getting in and they're compromising the integrity of some of the data, causing sort of collapse and um, taking these reactors off, uh, the, these power grids offline. Now, the real sort of nightmare scenario that I think can put a really fine point on what we're talking about is what would happen if one of the big banks, someone managed to get in there and start to compromise the integrity of data? This is not an easy thing to do. 
So don't worry too, too much about this, but it is a possibility. This is a sort of doomsday scenario. If you start to mess with the bits and bytes that underlie all of this, you can start to wreak some real havoc on the global economy because how many people would have to have, say, uh, the the thousand dollars in their account changed to a negative thousand dollars, and that to hit the media before people would start to panic about the trust that they're placing in the financial sector? How many people would try to pull out their money because they want to hold some sort of physical record or physical currencies in place of just storing it on uh, in in sort of in the corporate servers of say the big banks? And so this sort of integrity-based attack is again highly problematic, but it's another, one of those other forms uh, that can, I think, wreak some havoc on the sort of data-driven universe in which we're starting to increasingly live. And so in terms of causes for all of this, there's really sort of three categories that I would point to in sort of broad strokes. Again, we're sort of talking at a kind of a high-ish high -ish level here, but the three things that are sort of causing issues. The first I would point to is the sort of consumer or the, uh, the vendor incentives that are sort of part and parcel of pushing out products and software in today's environment, especially as it pertains to the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is still a poorly defined sort of uh, market. People don't know what's going to stick. A while back, we had Google Glass. That didn't go very well for Google, but other things have gone well, like Google Home. And so they're, they're basically pushing products out, and they're seeing if anything sticks. Now, the incentives that are built into that structure essentially says push things out fast because, and then let the market decide. And if it works, then we'll deal with security issues, then we'll deal with privacy issues. And so the incentives are kind of backwards. So we're, we're pushing products to market that are inherently insecure. A lot of them will actually build off of each other's insecure base platforms in order to try to get these things to work. And so you've got a host of vulnerable products that with, with little overseeing regulation, just being pushed to market because that's what the incentives say you should do. No time to sort of check the code for vulnerabilities or anything like that because the market doesn't allow it. The second kind of problem really focuses sort of more at a network level that we all use an internet service provider to connect to the internet, but internet service providers can actually do quite a bit to try to keep things safe and secure. Now this is a sort of a situation where bad actors can cause a lot of problems. And if you have a malicious network that's, say, contributing to distributed denial of service attacks or something like that, which would target the accessibility of data, then you have a, a pretty serious situation. Now, there's a great study that was done uh, about a decade ago now, but I think it's sort of exemplary of what we're talking about when I say bad actors in the internet service space. So, you know, Bell or Telus or Rogers, they're probably not the worst of the worst. But what this study dug up was effectively that 10 ISPs globally, and there are thousands, but 10 of them were accounting for upwards of 50% of the world's malicious traffic that was being observed. So there were 10 bad actors accounting for 50% of that traffic. If you move that number to, to sorry, to, for 30% of the traffic, if you move it to 50 ISPs, you are accounting to, for 50% of, of the malicious bad traffic. So there's a few internet service providers. They're clustered geographically in areas that uh, uh, we don't have jurisdiction over, obviously. Um, and that creates an additional layer of complication that bad ISPs can essentially facilitate malicious activity, facilitate cybercrime, and cause some fairly significant problems for average users, for organizations, and even for governments. And the final problem that I would sort of point to is this notion of uh, sort of a human failing in all of this. That it's, it's inherent in us to sort of think of the internet as a big technical system, and it is a big technical system, but at the same time, where human users play an integral role in keeping networks safe, or on the flip side of that, contributing to network insecurity. That in 2015, IBM surveyed 1,000 firms that they were responsible for security services for, and what they found was that in 95% of the security incidents that they observed in this 1,000 firms globally, human activity was involved in some capacity. This is everything from something like misconfiguring a router through to what they, they deemed to be the most common cause of a problem, which was essentially, and people could probably guess it because you've probably been told this before that it's a bad idea, clicking links in emails, clicking and opening attachments in emails, that that was the primary cause of insecurity. So there's a human uh, misalignment of incentives here as well, that we don't, we're not often on the hook if, say, we work in an organization and we click a link because email is part of our daily job, we're not on the hook for the full consequences of that. And so we sort of ship the, the who's to blame for what activities is sort of misaligned. And our actions can have widespread ramifications. And so people click links, and that causes some of this insecurity that we're talking about here. And so 
as Fen said, we're not going to just sort of scare you and then leave you. Uh, that there are things that I think can be done and can be done to sort of help remedy um, what we're talking about here. Some of this has to do with ISP level concerns. So if we talked about the, the, those 10 bad ISPs accounting for 30% of the traffic, you have the ability to blacklist the ISPs. And this would all be done at a sort of a network level, but you can find ways to sort of tailor traffic flows. You can find ways to sort of call out and publicly shame those bad ISPs that are causing problems. You can also push for regulation to do with um, the, with products and services that are pushed out at a sort of premature stage when they're still riddled with vulnerabilities and haven't really been through a standard uh, or a rigorous security check. That those sorts of consumer-driven efforts can do wonders to try to basically say, we're not going to accept a product just because it has a certain amount of promise. We want to accept a product that has promise but also has some security by design. And you can also sort of think on the human front that we all need to get a little bit better at actually dealing with the fact that we are kind of impulsive when we're sitting behind a computer screen and want to click the link and want to open the attachment, even if that can cause some pretty far-ranging consequences. And so the, the, I think, governance challenge in all of this is that what we're talking about here spans levels and layers, that we're sort of reaching from everything from an individual sitting behind their computer through firms, internet service providers, governments, all of these actors need, I think, to be involved in this sort of uh, governance complex because we're basically saying we need to create some sort of mutually reinforcing web. And it's a lot easier said than done, to be sure, but you can try to work uh, in sort of a... Uh, uh, no, I'm not going to say fusion because it's a, it's a specific type of organization that we're going to be talking about there, but you need to have everybody working together because if you don't, you're basically going to have piecemeal approaches at best uh, when really what you need is to bring together um, all of these actors into that, as I said, coherent mesh that sort of mirrors maybe the mesh of the larger internet. So that would be it because we're out of time. Thank you, Eric. Fan is glaring. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Neil and Jay uh, up to the stage to uh, provide some real enlightenment. Now, our format here is that uh, our two uh, uh, co-panelists uh, who've just joined us are going to say a few introductory remarks. Uh, we'll start with you, Jay, and then we'll turn to uh, Neil, and then we'll have uh, uh, an online discussion because there will be people joining us uh, online uh, if uh, uh, the technology works. I assume it will work. <laughs> yes. All right. So. So yeah, I, I'm Jay. Um, you know, I, I, I run a business um, with my team of um, threat hunters, and and the amount of evil that we see every minute of every day, it would it would shock you. And it's so normal for us. Yet when you know you talk to people outside of the community that we're in, they really, you know, you, there's that much stuff going on, and there literally is. There's constant attacks going on. We, we work uh, in the commercial world, uh, a lot in financial services, legal, but technology, mining, healthcare, um, the, the full spectrum, and everybody is being attacked. And you hear about all these great innovations that, um, that we take advantage of as, as businesses, cloud computing and, um, you know, and machine learning, and you know what, the bad guys are using all the same stuff. Um, just because you know, we're, we're, uh, we're using it for good doesn't mean that they're not using it for for evil, and, and, and one of the things that few people understand is how asymmetric the problem is. We have um, you know, threat actors that only have to be right once, and there's no penalty for them being wrong, yet as a defensive organization, you have to be right 100% of the time, and it's all downside when it's wrong. So, so it's, very, it's, it's very unbalanced. Uh, we have our adversaries embedded with the allies, using military analogies, and, um, and you can't distinguish. Uh, you, know, you, you hear about the you know, defense of cyber, um, and some people say, well, why don't you go and blow up the bad guys with an offensive cyber weapon? Well, the problem is, Attribution. You don't know that you're actually blowing up the bad guy. You might be, um, you know, it might be a university network that's been compromised to make to look like somewhere in Romania or Ukraine, and you go, you throw your cyber weapon in there, and all of a sudden, university down the street's offline. These are the sorts of challenges that we have. So, so you you are forced to be on your heels all the time, and um, 
And you know, we always talk about the actors get a vote. Um, no matter what we do, as soon as we engage, then you know, the, the, the rules of engagement may change. And um, it's a phenomenally challenging problem. Um, I don't think I was ADD when I came into the industry, but I acquired it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Everything we do every day is, is, is different, and, um, and we'll go into some more details of that later on. Neil? So I kind of take that, that macro perspective that was provided to us, and it's, I agree with everything said there. And there's a lot of really smart people, um, like Jay's team and, and others in town and around the world, trying to secure all of your assets, um, both the kind of tangible um, dollar assets, but other things that, that you don't even know are, are really valuable. Um, but inevitably, if there's anything of value in the world, someone wants to get it and not pay full price for it. And that's that's an unfortunate uh, thing that has transcended human time um, and, and the internet. Um, we at Magnet Forensics, we're a young company, um, and we were founded by a, um, a young, in his 20s, a police officer here in town who just happened to be working on a child luring case. A young child was lured out using Facebook. Um, and, and it really opened his eyes that, that everything he was being told at work Everything that he was being told about his job prospects said that you know, policing is not going to be as important in society. Crime is, is traditional crime is down. Funding for, for policing is going to go down in, in Canada and the Western world. And as he poked at this challenge of, of trying to rescue this child who's being lured out on, on Facebook, something he kind of took for granted a decade ago and, and only saw the positive in, really uncovered a really, really um, sad story. Um, which is the only areas of, of crime and despair that are, that are sharp and up and to the right on the chart are things enabled by the internet. And that is the underbelly that we don't talk enough about in, in society, that we put up big numbers like Equifax, and that makes the front page news. But last year in Canada, 150,000 uh, cases were opened for child pornography, and that was 4,000 children, um, unique children, um, behind those pictures. Those are real children being abused. Um, on the fraud side, um, a lot of vulnerable seniors um, are, 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 are the victim. They don't make the front page news because the dollar amount in itself is low um, because a lot of the actors who are out there are targeting vulnerable populations. Things that we don't even consider the internet um, as a crime area, you know, something like the fentanyl crisis hitting our cities, that has been wholly enabled um, by digital technologies. Things like the dark web and even the open web and very, very cheap shipping, which came from e-commerce platforms. Fentanyl is hitting our streets from China through letter mail. So I, I think you know everything about the internet from a democratizing f a function, from an um, e-commerce perspective, it, it, it's empowering. But there is vulnerability, and, and I'll just make one um, um, point, and I'll be um, apologizing up front to, to Jay and my family who are engineers. Um, the internet was conceived of by engineers and a lot of altruistic people, um, and things like privacy, um, things like um, securing vulnerable populations were not uh, conversations on the front end, and we're now going back trying to have governance conversations about how do we ensure vulnerable populations or those at risk on platforms that are intended for adults um, aren't being hurt. So I mean, that, that, those are the types of things we think about day to day in the work we're doing. I'm not offended. Um, my whole business exists because of engineering mistakes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've been throwing a f fair number of acronyms around and I can see the faces of the audience beginning to glaze over, but there's one that's really uh, important and, and that's uh, the dark web. Uh, there's a chapter in the book uh, that talks about the dark web. Uh, I'm going to ask Eric to very quickly um, explain what it is. Um, one of the things we found when we did some polling in uh, 25 different jurisdictions, national jurisdictions, and those results are reported in the book, is that uh, by far and away the majority of the world's population, something like 70%, would like the bad side of the internet, the dark web, to be shut down. Uh, and you could actually do it. It's technically pretty easy to do it. It might put some of our colleagues on the panel out of business, uh, but uh, no guarantee there. Uh, but maybe, uh, Eric, you could just explain what the dark web is, and then um, Neil and Jay, you could talk about some of the, uh, uh, the real challenges uh, that uh, you and your colleagues are facing, uh, you know, going after the bad guys on the dark web. Sure. So, it's it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. Make it simple. Oh, it's very <laughs> simple. 
So I, I, could, I could say it in just a few lines, really, that the typical internet connection, so whether, you, whether if you're looking at CNN news or you're shopping on Amazon or whatever, it's a direct connection, more or less, that you're, you're going f via your internet service provider to their servers and they're returning information to you. What the dark web does is essentially use a layer of technology riding on the basic technology of the internet to basically break that signal up. So rather than go directly, you're going through a series of relays that are basically hopping around the world. If you've seen sort of crime shows where they have the fancy map and it bounces around all over the globe from Nigeria to, to China to the Europe back into the United States or something to that effect, that's essentially what we're talking about. That you get an anonymity as a result of these hops and it creates a, a, a layer of the internet where you can both host content, what are known as hidden services, which I'm sure we'll speak of because there's some pretty nasty stuff going on there. Uh, it allows you to host content, but also allows you to surf the web anonymously so that, that say, uh, commercial platforms can't figure out who you are or your ISP can't figure out what you're viewing and things of that sort. So the dark web has those sort of two meanings of both hosted content and anonymous surfing, but the core component is really you're doing it in a way that doesn't allow people to know who you are or figure out who you are for the most part. So maybe I'll just add a bit on the historical side. It was a construct of the US government. The, the original argument for it was to get content to those who were in repressive regimes, a very noble cause. Um, and a lot of folks who, who are proponents of these types of technologies generally tie themselves to very, very noble missions. Where they lose um, a lot of steam is um, when, when you actually see practically what's, what's going on. So if you're a human course. rights uh, dissident in, uh, let's say, Iran, the dark web is a good place to be because you can communicate with other human rights activists, but the Iranian government doesn't know who you are or where you are. But in fact, right? you know, in, 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 there's different studies and there's different numbers. Because of the nature, it's very hard to study. But, but some estimates say that 60, over 60% 60 of the content currently on the dark web um, includes everything from, as I mentioned, fentanyl, um, guns, drugs, um, the one interesting one in Canada, and it's a very sad story, but, but children are being sold uh, on the dark web from, from third world countries. Um, and it, it has been um, the key enabler of human trafficking, unfortunately, in this region of, of Ontario, the 401 belt, everywhere east of Toronto, right through to, um, to Windsor. And that's been wholly enabled um, by the economy of the dark web. So that's the downside. And, and, and policing that challenge um, obviously is difficult. Um, not knowing who you're dealing with, obviously a very, very hard challenge, um, but the constant movement, that is the other piece, that there is no jurisdiction on the dark web. There is no um, friend along the other line in Nigeria on the law enforcement agency to say, hey, I'm, I'm following up on a child being trafficked from your country because you don't know if that case actually originates um, in Nigeria. So the proponents of shutting it down have a very strong argument. Um, the proponents for it have a very strong existential argument when they're talking about repressive regimes, um, you know, whether it's Middle East or in other parts of the world. Jay? Well, the history of <coughs> the underlying technology actually was an open source. I don't know if some of you have heard of open source. Uh, it was a project the U.S. Navy uh, created for these purposes to, uh, to allow people to obfuscate. Um, unfortunately, it's been corrupted and used for different um, purposes. And in the commercial world, which is primarily our customers, um, we, you know, we, we see the effect of the dark web as a, as a marketplace for trading methods and tradecraft. Um, so, you know, attackers uh, are very opportunistic. Um, and I would, would say that, you know, based on our traffic, you know, last time we, 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 we studied it like, sort of on a monthly basis, we're running in the 99% range are opportunistic cyber crimes. So this is the equivalent of, in the old days, somebody throwing a brick through a plate glass window and stealing the TV on display. So it's very much a smash and grab. They do it if they can get away with it. And um, the more defenses an organization puts up, the, the more friction there is. So they go on to, to an easier uh, spot. But, but the enablement of the criminals is really uh, is the, is the, um, the big challenge. So the internet is great for, you know, I have a piece of information, I share it uh, with Neil, and he tells one per and then so it's, you know, and they told two friends, they told two friends, and you have this sort of binary factor uh, going on. And, and we had the exact same thing going on with the methods and the tradecraft. So the techniques that are used to break into organizations, to establish the beachhead, to lift your banking credentials, or to you know, do the, uh, the ransomware 
attacks, you don't actually have to be a hacker that's really gifted. You can figure most of this stuff out online. Uh, you can get YouTube training. Uh, everything you need to be a criminal is at your fingertips. And if you, if you look at it through the eyes of law enforcement on crime, this was sort of started by the FBI. They, they look at the, the through the lens of means, motive, and opportunity. So if you look at the means, the tradecraft is widely available. I don't know if you've heard of the equation group. That's the, the code name for the NSA. They lost three quarters of their methods um, to hacking, and that's now been distributed amongst the, uh, the, um, the, the, the dark web community, and the WannaCry and, um, and other uh, uh, exploits were based on, um, on some of the best methods that, that our, our top security agency in the world, unfortunately, lost. And so uh, that also levels the playing field. So, so you have this challenge where they can acquire the skills very quickly, they can be effective, so there's the means. Um, the motive is, you know, they, they've got the skill and they know that, um, that they can, um, you know, like they hear about their pal who you know, just made 50 grand for 40 hours worth of work and they're working as a taxi driver or a barista in Bucharest or some place where they're making 20 bucks a day and it just, it's just, not, it's not balanced and, and their friend gets away with it and all of a sudden they flip. And then the um, opportunity to get away with it um, uh, with impunity is basically law enforcement cannot uh, reach them. There's 98 cooperating countries in Interpol. If you talk to law enforcement on how they have to draft a warrant that can get prosecuted by your district attorney and then taken to uh, the Interpol equivalent, then boots on the ground, that's a six month window. And as we were talking about how you, know, you can anonymize yourself, you can be, you can be gone in hours. So, so there's nothing that, that, that they can do for you in any reasonable time. And the dark web is the enabler of this. The methods are traded, um, the exchange, Bitcoin was one of the original uh, cyber currencies used to settle. Um, when we want to, you know, as, as criminals, uh, create a business relationship, you know, I can send an ICQ or a message request, hey, Neil, you know how to get into this type of organization? Yeah, okay, um, once, once we're in, um, I know how to uh, monetize that exploit. And we do a split down the middle, 50-50. So literally in four minutes, we're business partners. There's no lawyers, there's no contracts. It's a frictionless economy that's moving at a speed that we don't appreciate. And that, that is the dark web that is you know, driving these, you know, these two trillion numbers that you saw up there. And, and it is, you know, we often refer to it as background radiation. If you're on the internet and you're doing business, you're going to get popped. It's just a question of when and how, how much. And uh, I know that's a, sort of a dire message, but uh, that, that is what we're up against. We see it all day long. But w what's dire uh, here is this, not just... Wait, wait a minute. W one of the, uh, you know, the, the messages uh, in, in, in the book that uh, Eric and I wrote is that the public is getting worried, actually, about their security, their safety online. Um, not in sufficient numbers so there's a mad stampede to throw away your iPhone and uh, toss your uh, uh, computer uh, into uh, you know, the local garbage dump. But the fact of the matter is uh, people are changing their behavior online. Um, uh, they're worried, uh, uh, they're more careful about you know, the websites they go to. Uh, some people, uh, particularly younger people, are uh, committing what's called Facebook suicide because they want to destroy the, uh, uh, the information trail that they've created in their salad days. Um, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about you know, the, the trust factor? And, uh, and, and you know, should we be worried? Should those who are in the business of selling goods and services online, be worried about what the public is thinking about the internet? Yeah, yeah, so I think there's, there's, there's two things that I would raise. One is what Fenn asked me to talk about. The second is um, a, a, just a general point about trust, that one of the things that I'd like to show in answering his question is that trust is a bit multidimensional, that none of us have just a single vision of what we're talking about when we say we trust something, say like a technology like the internet, and that part of that multidimensionality means that sometimes these components can conflict. And I think I can, I can, think I can highlight that by answering what Fenn was after. So I think a really great example of sort of the erosion of trust would come from something like Edward Snowden, that his disclosures, his disclosures had a huge effect on the way in which um, internet users around the world used the internet as a technology. That you had, according to the numbers that we collected, you had upwards of about 710 million people who said, I use the internet less often than I used to. 
that these were sort of working through the numbers in the, poll the countries that we'd polled, that was the kind of volume that we were talking about. And those are self-reported numbers, and there's issues there and all the rest. But what really points, I think, to the contradiction and takes us back to the topic of the dark web that we're speaking of is that you also had a massive jump in use of the technologies of the dark web immediate fo immediately following the disclosure of uh, some, of the, the, uh, some of the NSA's behavior. And so people, they stopped trusting the, uh, the technology of the internet because they learned that it was being used for, for surveillance purposes by government, and they substituted towards a technology that's nominally used by criminals, but also used increasingly by the general public. And the problem there is that if you only had criminals using the dark web, it would be really easy to deal with, or easier, I should say, not really easy, easier to deal with crime on the dark web because you're basically saying everything here is criminal, so we'll treat it as such and deal with it. When you have this sort of admixture of sort of uh, uh, dual use, you start to run into a bit more of a problem. So if privacy conscious individuals start to use those technologies because they've been shied away from um, other parts of the internet uh, and the overlaid technology, then you end up with um, sort of two points that sort of come into friction and, and, and into contrast there. Do you want to comment? Well, you know, I, I will probably be the, you know, contrarian on some of the things related to, um, to the clandestine snooping of, of our agencies, but um, I can tell you that every single day we use the exact same technologies because it works. It's very effective for us to find the adversaries. We can't find them without using those techniques. So you get this, you get this collision on, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, trying to protect yourself. Um, uh, your, your, your personal privacy and um, trying to keep yourself safe. And, and you know, so, so, you know, a lot of the, the best um, uh, tech, uh, uh, tools and, um, and technology that, that finds its way into the commercial world, which we are now using to secure banks and all the places you do business with, have come out of these agencies. There's actually a, a fairly robust spin-out uh, program. So, so we, we do, we, we have a bit of, you know, speaking out of both sides of our, of our mouths on this particular matter. And, um, and you know, the, I, I happen to have a, a chance to speak at a conference with George W. And, um, and it was, you know, he's a phenomenal in-person speaker, TV name. You're talking about the former president, former of, the president States, of the United States, George W. And, Bush. And, um, and it was no bigger than this. And, um, there's no reporters here. Okay, so here's what really happened. And he was basically telling the room of CFOs and COOs from uh, Wall Street that, um, you know, remember how you felt the day of 9-11 and, and the week and the days after. And, um, and remember that feeling. Uh, we had no clue. We had no idea any of this uh, was going on right under our own noses. So we had to create an apparatus to get smart in the surveillance programs. And there's many, many different ones that uh, the various agencies uh, ran. And um, if you want to get mad at anybody, get mad at me. So this is what he was telling, telling the world. But that's, that's where it all really uh, started. And that's not that long ago in technology terms. But, um, but you know, they had a targeting uh, principle system where they could, they could try to, you know, develop patterns around um, adversaries and they would use this to to then um, you know enable humans to go and, and further pursue it and and it's really that that was what their mission was and of course you know the the oh, big brother Orwellian uh, problem is uh, is that uh, if you know maybe with a different uh, president <clears throat> I don't know maybe <laughs> current um, we've we've now got a situation where though that data could be used for different purposes and um, but you know, if you look at what everybody surrenders to uh, social media, Facebook, Google, all the different tools that you use, the amount of data collection going on there is vastly greater than anything that uh, Snowden was talking about in any of his uh, revelations. So, so we do have a bit of a, a challenge here. I think that, um, I think that we have to um, accept that um, there's a certain level of this required. I think we have to trust our governments more than anybody wants to, that they're not going to use it for evil. Um, but um, at the same time, um, we have to sort of <laughs> you know, keep, our, you know, keep our eyebrow raised on it. And there's another challenge, which I'm going to actually pass to, to Neil, because his firm's very expert in the, the challenge around encryption. And um, you know, we tell all of our uh, customers, encrypt all the data that's flowing and all the data that's at rest. And 
Um, if you don't do that, then you know, shame on you. And and you know, the NSA got hacked because they didn't follow. This this is you know, 101 in uh, cybersecurity is encrypt your most important stuff. Well, they didn't, and that's why they lost all that stuff. So, but there's other challenges in encryption with law enforcement, and you deal with it every day, yeah. Neil. So, I mean, when we look at the trust issue, um, and and to tie it into the encryption uh, challenge or or opportunity, depending on who you are, I see this whole thing as a, as a large pendulum. Um, and, and the internet's still relatively new. We're just seeing the first generation um, um, who are going to live their whole lives with the internet. You know, digital natives is the term uh, that's used. Um, and what we saw from Snowden was a wild swing on that pendulum. Um, distrust of government and globally speaking, here in Canada, not as sharp, but still um, a lot of questions for government. And the large platform technology companies, which frankly have done very well economically, they've moved to the, the, the top of every kind of economic rating, um, had a gut reaction. They saw the same public opinion data. They actually had better public opinion data. They were mining the data that you were providing about your, your, your distrust of the US government when it came to your Facebook account. Facebook was mining that data. And um, in, in a matter of a year, what we saw were technologies um, that are free, to you um, were being installed end-to-end um, -end encryption for data in transit. So when I sent a message to Fenn, NSA or anyone else couldn't get that. But also when it came to my device, my device was also getting encryption. When we say encryption, you know, 20 years ago, the only, the only devices that had encryption to this level were military grade. We're now talking about you know, a 13-year-old iPhone having military grade uh, encryption. And this sounds fantastic. When it's told to you by the CEO of Apple, it sounds great. I want all my data uh, being, being encrypted. But I'll give you a practical example of where our software um, tried to recover some evidence. In a murder case in New Orleans, a young woman, uh, pregnant, was murdered. Critical evidence about um, the suspect, who was a, a boyfriend, um, was on the device that, that he had premeditated this and had sent threatening messages. Well, she has the newest um, iPhone and cannot um, be unlocked without um, the user's password and fingerprint. Um, I'm quite certain uh, someone who's gonna be murdered would waive their right to privacy, but she doesn't have that option because of the way the settings are. And a lot of these companies, they're making these the de facto settings when you purchase them. So the new regulator is not um, the government. What's happened post Snowden is the technology companies and their, their settings are the new governors of how we live our lives and, and what level of privacy is right for society. I, I do think we need really, really good debates post Snowden on what level of privacy is right, but sophisticated societies don't give unlimited rights to privacy. If I'm committing crimes in my home, police have the right with a warrant to come in. The challenge we're facing now because of these decisions and because of where public trust has gone is that we, we don't have as a right as a society to decide what level of privacy uh, we're going to have. Um, we're just gi it's given to us, and we don't even know that. One of the things that Eric talked about, and I alluded to it as well, is that we're fast moving into uh, uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, and all that means is that there are more uh, objects hooked up to the Internet than people. Um, and that happened some time ago. Uh, but um, should we be worried? I mean, you know, Eric talked about the fact that, you know, there isn't a premium on security if you're developing a new app or if you're putting, uh, 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 you know, internet uh, uh, connections into uh, your toothbrush so that uh, not only is that toothbrush telling you when you should uh, change uh, heads, but that you might have uh, uh, some dental requirements uh, coming along the way because it's monitoring uh, the health of your teeth. Um, but it's also, you know, taking a lot of data. Uh, and that toothbrush could also be weaponized. Um, uh, and, and you may laugh, <laughs> but, you know, the next major cyber attack may come from fridges or toothbrushes uh, the so-called distributed denial of service attacks. We saw one of those uh, last November, I guess. Dine. Yeah. The Dine attack, which uh, was launched apparently through camcorders. Uh, baby monitors. Or baby monitors, and it shut down the entire internet of the eastern seaboard for almost half a day. Yeah. Uh, it was followed a couple of weeks later by a similar kind of attack, not as successful, on the west coast of the United States. The conclusion I drew 
was that it's probably safer to live in the Midwest. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but, you know, as we move into, rapidly move into this new world, um, where's security? And, you know, are you guys going to be able to, you know, keep pace with technological evolution? And how do we get, how do we get young companies to make security pay? I mean, if you, if you think back to the automobile industry back in the early 60s, where the focus was on design, it wasn't on safety, right? Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Ralph Nader came along, he wrote a famous book called Unsafe at Any Speed, and suddenly you got this sort of consumer movement that said, you know, security matters, we're all going to buy Volvos because they're safer. Uh, do you see a similar kind of thing happening in, in your world or not? Well, you know, absolutely. We, we are at, as a, you know, as much as we've grown up, you know, 20 odd years, we're still at a very nascent uh, level uh, in the internet. Um, you know, the Dyn example being a, you know, a very, very recent one, it is not resilient at the level that, like, our degree of dependence on it versus the resilience are, are, are out of whack right now. And there's got to be a lot of work in there. But you know, let, if we look at um, one of the um, the biggest challenges. Um, in, in, in a lot of the analogies you know, relate back to military kind of scenarios because it's well understood. It's been studied for thousands of years. Um, what we are doing by, um, by moving um, workloads, as we call them, into the cloud, that's basically you know, using some online service it's in the cloud. So the cloud is, you know, data centers that are hosted. Um, some of them far more virtual than than physical ones. But um, but as as we move more and more work outside of the perimeter of our office, uh, think in terms of your building with a fence around it, um, and that's where all the stuff used to happen. That's where the mainframes were, and they become PC networks, and then they con connected to the internet. Now we actually, and, and, and that's what we call the attackable surface. We now have attackable surface all over the place, out in the wild, so to speak. So you've got, you know, if you're using an iPhone, you've got all of your iCloud stuff, uh, and, and if you're using, um, you know, Salesforce for all your sales data, and Amazon Web Services, and the list goes on and on, and these are very normal. So what's happening in and we see this trend going on right now is uh, it's called the hybrid cloud where where companies are taking the lowest friction option instead of upgrading their mail uh, server they just put it up on the cloud so now you've got your most sensitive information in the cloud and and this isn't necessarily bad but what you are doing when you do that is you're abdicating your security decision as a company to the cloud providers now as it turns out that uh, you know the Amazons and Microsofts and, and Salesforce and Google, they their brand is highly dependent on them having impeccable security. So you will see very few uh, large-scale breaches from those firms. But um, you know, not to say they can't happen. Their entire future um, depends on, on their ability to defend it. But this is the challenge that we have is, um, is we are distributing and moving stuff faster into these environments. We're abdicating the security decision. And if bad things happen, there's not much you can do about it. And um, by the way, as a company, and this would apply to you personally, as a company, you're, you're responsible for that decision. So this is where you, you end up seeing CEOs and you know, chief technology officers get whacked or fired because they, they, they made some decisions and they didn't do all the safeguards that they should have. And, and you know, the, the, um, the court of 2020 hindsight will always say it's your fault. But this is, this is where we're at. So we've got a huge, a huge, um, wave of, of moving workloads into the cloud. You know, if you went to a conference, a technology conference five years ago, it was utopia and everyone was going to put everything there by now, but it hasn't gone that way. It's, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. So there's a long way to go and we're living in this hybrid world where we have all of these exposed attackable surfaces that have varying degrees of, of uh, security on them. And, and we use the analogy, it's the weakest link in the chain. The bad guys will find the weakest link and they'll use that to, to go upstream and downstream and exploit that. So you have this, this is the world that we are in right now. So it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And, um, and you know, I'm, again, <laughs> presenting a dark picture, but that's, yeah. that's what well, we live the, in right now. Well, the, 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 uh, we're, we're, we're gonna make the audience very worried. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm sure the audience has, uh, has questions. You've been very patient uh, listening to us for uh, the past hour. So what I'd now like to do is to uh, invite uh, questions from the audience. There's a microphone there. There's a microphone there. Um, I believe some people may come in online. Is that right? 
Um, yeah. uh, and um, if you wish to direct your question to one of the panelists, please indicate who you would like it to be. Or if it's a general question for the, uh, for the panel, then I'll try to field it. If you could also say who you are, um, since uh, this event is being recorded, I understand. So um, for posterity, if you could also uh, identify yourself. You, sir. I'm Warren Law, and I'm going to start by saying I need your help in putting my question together, because I'm kind of old. I've been told that I have to have a special wallet so people can't scan my credit card. The gym has... Uh, exact same one. It's a Faraday my, shield. My gym yeah. card apparently has an RF device or something uh, in it. The, it that, that, that's my problem, but what's my question? What am I, how am I trying to understand what this RF stuff means? Do I have to worry about it? If I may jump in right away, um, because we both have the same type of wallet. Um, the, one of the points that I think I would make on this front is there's a trade-off between the usability of all the stuff that we're talking about and the security of it. And you're never going to get 100% security while being connected to the internet. If you want that, you basically pull a Unibomber, don't bomb things, but just go where he lived, live in a cabin in Montana, and don't really interact with the world. That's probably, for most of us, not something that we're, is a highly appealing option. And so we, we need to make a series of determinations and trade-offs. So you can use a certain level of best practice and security in certain realms of your life and other levels at others. So if I'm dealing with my banking credentials, I'll use complex passwords. If I'm dealing with a website that I don't really care about, I submit things to academic journals, for example. It's the same password on every single one. That way I can remember it because it, it's a part of my life where I'm going to emphasize usability over security because I don't care if people get into that particular component. And so to, how I would sort of help you frame the question is sort of like you feel maybe a little overwhelmed by you know, the acronyms, by the advances in technology, and you don't know what to do. And I would basically say you need to tailor it to your own circumstances and tailor it within your own life to the particular components. That not, you don't need a... a uh, uh, I give, you're, you're not going to have one level of security across your entire life. It's going to vary based on what sort of s what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, another way to, to look at it is, I could tell in your question that you're stressed out about it, and and this is only one dimension, and it's very stressful, and it's a, uh, you know, it's it's. It's black magic for all of us guys in the industry. Uh, we speak in, in, in code. So, um, but the thing to understand is it's, um, you know, and, and much to Eric's point, is it's about risk reduction. And you've got to figure out where you're going to you know, put your calories to reduce the risk. And, and you know, as you say, the example of things like you know, banking passwords. Um, how many here have heard of double factor security? That's where you're, okay, there's, there's a hand. Um, so <laughs> I would say if you can do that, that's one of the best things you can do, where you actually have, you know, where they send you a code on your phone or you actually have a token. It's inconvenient. Every bit of security is a speed bump. But for things that are really important, you use double factor security. You know, other things like, uh, you know, iPhone, as much as, um, you know, this, I'm not trying to plug the brand, they have a walled garden model where applications get get approved and voted into the uh, app store and everything is very protected there and they have you know, they have one percent of the uh, attack rate of android which is on the other extreme um, in my company we don't even allow Android. that's not a paid political yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't use android with blackberry and, and iphone just because those happen to be in today's day and age the things that reduce the risk it's not zero but you reduce it so so the unfortunate part is from the consumer perspective how do you you know find the right answers to all of this stuff so you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, we deal mostly with corporate, and whenever we talk to media, they want to know what are the three things that I should be doing to protect myself. So figure out the double factor security for the important stuff as, as a starting point, and then and try to read up on, on the things that get hacked the least, and that's where you, know, you can direct your resources. Do we have other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So my name is, uh, is Robert Milligan, Milligan. I'm very interested in the uh, future of technology and, uh, and so on. Now, a big concern uh, that I have is, is that um, elite uh, groups of people that love uh, wealth and power 
will move things towards getting more and more control uh, of, of um, quantum computers and have more and more methods that they could use to increasingly, in turn, uh, control the world. Now, this goes on so that increasingly AI considers these humans problematic in all sorts of way, including their destroying the infrastructure where they uh, uh, operate, and they decide to to take over themselves, and uh, they manage the world, and we haven't left them with any viable higher values that uh, you know wealth and power could have served, so wealth and power didn't destroy everything. And uh, so that too, they involved more human beings, made them smarter, etc. So other, we could have more humans participating in, in the advancement uh, of, of our potentially co-evolving world. So uh, for, for food for thought, if anybody wants to respond, that's just fine with me. I'll maybe unpack one, one piece. The large platform technology companies um, who offer a free service, right? Facebook, Google, um, offer free services, yet are at the top of every major um, valuation list of companies in the world today. Um, you have to ask the question of why. There, I mean, they really should change the 101 economics thing to there's no such thing as a free app because there really shouldn't be a free app. There's a lot of valuable things that we're providing um, to these platforms that they are amassing and then selling back to us with our information. And I think we're starting to see that trust pendulum swing back. I think they did a great job post Snowden capturing the trust um, of uh, their user base and, and broader society. Um, they went into new markets, they went into to Asia and Africa, but we're seeing it come back. We're seeing the stuff on fake news come back and hit uh, Facebook very, very hard. So my only comment to you on this is ask tough questions. Um, they are their regulators. Um, you do not see politicians in legislatures around the world challenging Facebook. They are in bed with Facebook because Facebook's a great channel for them to do their um, business. So I think we're still early days on this subject, but these large platform companies, which claim they don't sell you anything, are amassing huge cash stockpiles, buying up AI algorithms, buying up some of the best minds in the world and putting them to work on a lot of different projects. I think we need some more questions out there because there really is no such thing as a free app. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Mikolai Biroko. Um, I actually want to lighten up a little bit the mood. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, when we go to uh, DEF CON or SHMUCON, it's actually the conferences for the hackers who some attack you or work for you, right? Uh, they say uh, two things. First of all, all of those problems which we are fighting, they're actually mostly a low-lying fruits. Like, programmers are not, not thinking about uh, defenses, not at all. Uh, and another one is defenders are not actually in a negative position. So attacker chooses the time of, of attack. Defender chooses the playing field. Can you talk about it? I can take it if you want. Okay. So I mean, I think um, we've used the term hacker as a pejorative this evening, and it's a, it's a natural tendency, um, but it really shouldn't be. There's a lot of inquisitive minds, some of the world's smartest minds that are out there today, who are tackling the same challenges JP's company, my company are looking at, and they're turning around and handing it to companies as opposed to exploiting those companies. Um, and, and that's a really, really valuable feat. And I think some companies are starting to realize that is something they want to incentivize, that they need that kind of mind out there. And I'll say that there's a, and I don't fully understand it, we have some of them in our company, there is a certain mind out there that wants these challenges, not to become rich, but, but to take on challenges. And they just want to be properly acknowledged. And it's an interesting phenomenon on the negative side of the hacking world that it's not always about the money. Um, there's a big community um, who likes to um, um, 
talk about what they do and, and, and claim victory. Um, so I think it's, um, it's a term, uh, children, frankly, as going through school, we always talk about coding, but hacking is a term that also is starting to be rebranded as something. It's an inquisitive mind that wants to say everything isn't perfect. The engineering behind this is flawed from the start, that, that release dates are, are, are what drives companies, not perfect products. So I think um, um, as you kind of talk to, to kids um, who are thinking about careers and things like that, it's not just about coding, it's that inquisitive mind um, that hackers, and uh, that, that they bring to the table that's very, very important. Yeah, we have, uh, we employ a lot of them. Um, we um, talk about our threat hunters. Those are the, those are on the front lines 24-7 dealing with uh, the adversaries. And we characterize them as, you know, one part um, network engineer, one part, one part air traffic controller, and one part World of Warcraft. And if they don't have <laughs> those affinities, then they generally self-select out. Um, they, they quite literally go home at night after dealing with hackers in the real world, and they get on the boards and do another six hours. I, I can't, I'm not that guy, but that's, that's who we employ. And, and they are very, very much able to keep, you know, 30 different exploit attempts, you know, 30 planes in the air at the same time. But on the vulnerabilities, there, um, there's uh, bug bounties that are paid, um, and there's a bit, you know, like you say, there's more pride in that than, um, than monetary uh, gain. But Microsoft used to refuse to pay them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so if, if you've got a vulnerability, um, a zero day, this is something where there's code that's out in the wild that hasn't, uh, that's got a way to penetrate it to actually uh, do harm. Um, the, the discoverer of that, if they're, you know, and, and there's this sort of gray area where you know they'll go to Microsoft, and Microsoft will actually pay. I believe it's 250,000 now. It used to be 150. Um, if you have the remedy for the vulnerability, so they'll pay you for that. However, you could also go to the um, the uh, Russian business network, who are the really good <laughs> hackers, as many know, and they might pay you 500 grand. So uh, you know, for exclusive rights to it. So so you have this sort of community where they're they're on both sides, and the the agencies like the NSA and the Chinese government and the North Koreans are all in this in this market buying up these these exploits. So the ones that are most useful are the ones that have the widest um, uh, implementation and are hardest to fix. So so there is this whole role on the vulnerabilities, uh, the whole market around that. You sir. Hey, uh, my name's Colin, and uh, I guess I'm speaking rather loudly. Um, <laughs> on the topic of uh, the allusion to the backdooring into things like iPhones, um, what is wrong with the, I mean, in the context of understanding that 99% of backdoors eventually end up getting discovered by other companies or people who shouldn't have access, so in the case of BlackBerry, at some point, other countries that you didn't necessarily want access to the master key to the back BlackBerry internet service, which was the public uh, service, um, suddenly you have them being able to snoop all of your traffic if they had somebody being able to view that. Um, same thing with the DVD um, encryption key. Somebody managed to gain access to that, and now that whole protection is gone. And the time that it takes for your HDMI TV to turn on um, being about 10 full seconds, is it trying to make sure that the encryption between the source and your eyes is secure? Um, but that was also broken. Um, what, I guess I'm trying to get to my point here, but what, how do you assert a certain level of backdoor in a safe way um, to not only allow us to get a leg up on criminals, but also respect people's privacy and understand that if it's there, it's probably eventually gonna be a problem. Eric, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I think I have sort of a, a, a very small two-part answer, because as you were going through and listing the sort of discovery of um, unintentional vulnerabilities in all of these uh, nominally secure applications and programs, you've basically highlighted the point that building backdoors in deliberately seems like a terrible idea. Because you're basically just adding in on purpose a weakness that can be eventually discovered and exploited. And that's, that seems like a bad idea. And so in the San Bernardino uh, terrorist incident, 
they ended up, the, the FBI ended up locked out of the iPhone, asked for a backdoor or a way in from Apple. Apple said no. And eventually they ended up finding a way in anyways from an Israeli firm. So there was ways in because there were backdoors that were built in by mistake. So I don't think there's much of an argument to be made for the idea that deliberately trying to establish those is a good idea. Because um, that's, I think, just sort of asking for uh, a whole host of sort of follow-on consequences that are probably, I think, overly negative. And there are, you know, I think legitimate concerns about giving governments access to those keys for security reasons. Governments, as we've discovered, are notoriously bad at security. Uh, no, and you know, the, one of the biggest attacks uh, on data was on the personnel records of, of some 20 million employees of the US government, including personal security files. Yeah, all the cleared uh, people. And, and these were people with security clearances. Uh, and there have been a lot of bad jokes that have come from some of those who were compromised about who now knows their deepest, darkest, innermost secrets. Um, so that, that, that again is an argument that, you know, if there is a back door, you know, who has access uh, to, uh, to the keys. But there are obviously very legitimate concerns of the kind that Neil talked about uh, earlier, about encryption where nobody has access to the data other than the user. You know, the example of the cell phone of somebody who's been murdered and you need access to that cell phone to find out who did it, you know, to put it crudely. So there, there are lots of issues there that have been debated, you know, is, is encryption a good thing, a bad thing? I think one of the uh, commentators uh, talked about some of the technological innovation that's going to come, you know, which may make uh, it easier to break encryption codes. Uh, uh, as uh, as uh, the technology uh, evolves. And, and one thing I think we should all be aware of is that five years from now, the internet uh, may be totally unrecognizable as a technology from what we're seeing right now. I, w I would just add one small point, which is also that what the FBI was looking for from Apple in the San Bernardino case, which is a way into a particular phone, was a effectively in some ways facilitated by the iPhone 10, which you can just unlock by looking at someone's face. So they, they didn't build a backdoor into the core system. They basically built an application that's nominally appealing to users, which allows law enforcement access under certain circumstances. And, and we shouldn't be naive as well about some of the motivations here. Apple sells far more phones outside of the US market than it does inside the US market. So if it's seen to be in collusion in allowing U.S. government access into those cell phones, it would obviously hurt its brand internationally. So there are very powerful commercial incentives that are at play as well here. Um, you, sir. And I haven't seen any questions coming online. It doesn't mean nobody's watching us. <laughs> we were hacked. We were hacked. <laughs> All right, you, yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. My name's Paul, although I don't know why you need to know that if this is going on the internet, but okay. Um, it seems to me like there's all these dystopias that are kind of fighting each other, and we're racing to see which one we're going to get into first. Like, are we going to get into the one where there's too much privacy, and then there's dark web, and the police can't do anything, and so every, there's crime everywhere, or are we going to be in the total surveillance state where everybody knows everything about us, regardless of whether we want them or not? Are we going to end up in this kind of world where you have to be a big player if you want to be on the internet? You have to hire eCentire or else you're going to be hacked in 30 seconds. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. Yeah. There's the commercial. So <laughs> that was superbly said. The answer is yes and yes, but like, I'll let my yeah. pa I'll let the panelists uh, respond. So, I mean, there's a question there too, which yes. is like, we got it. Can they all be happening? Yeah. Um, and is there any other scenario that's not terrible for the future? So I, I think uh, you have to put it in, in, in the right framing here. Generally, society has a lot of great things going on. The internet enables a lot of that. You know, if I want to start a business tonight, I can have a full business started. I can be selling tomorrow legally. 
of, of, a, of, of a product. And, and that is all because of the internet. The one thing that I find very, very struggling is you have people who talk about the internet as though it's a parallel universe. No, it's an amplification of our world. And I think when we're saying that it's these either ors, I think, no, we're actually just playing on the margins here. How do you make the core of the technologies we use, um, how do we make them better our day-to-day -day lives? So there's a lot of good from this phone. Like I just talk down encryption and what it's doing to law enforcement, but I use it because it makes my life a lot better. But it can still be better, and I think we have to expect more, that this is not some place where engineers go off to a corner and don't have to consider things like the law. They don't have to um, worry about health, what looking at this all day does to your health. I think society has to start pressuring the engineers to come into society a little more and, 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 and figure out that those are what we, um, th those are how we organize our societies and technology should amplify those values. You know, future state, I uh, envision something like what the agencies have already done. They operate on the internet completely cloaked. Um, there's another internet on, within the internet. You know, there's the dark web and then there's the agency web, if you will. So I see the commercial version of that being our future state. Or you, you will pay a premium to be on the secured version. And the other one will be like the Wild West. And that's largely where we're, we're playing right now. This is what I, I would submit is what it looks like in five years. And, and we, I, I, I'm aware of these technologies coming out of the agencies, going through commercialization discussions at this point in time. It may be a surprise to everyone that the most secretive organization, the CIA, has 80% of their workloads uh, moving to um, Amazon and Microsoft Azure um, on the C2 network. Um, that's, it's actually uh, underway right now. They figured out ways to, to basically operate there and be completely cloaked. And those, those methods and techniques will become what I see the commercial world, the safe to do business world. And the other one will probably be closer to free and you know, everything has a price. If you want to you know, have a low risk, be secure version, you're gonna have to pay a premium to play in that world. And that's, that, that's the way I think the econ economy will settle the, this problem. I might just add that in, in one sense, the dystopias that you identified could well happen if we don't take security seriously, if we don't take privacy seriously. And you know, the, the greatest risk that this technology faces, and it's underscored in our book in some you know, very good stories as well as data that uh, we've found over a period of several years of polling is that people will vote with their feet. You know, we haven't seen the kind of, you know, market crash equivalent yet because very bad things have happened online. The, the bad things that have happened are to some extent manageable subject to the qualifications that Neil talked about, you know, particularly when, you know, there are bad things that happen to young people online. I mean, that's irredeemable and irretrievable. But, you know, if, if a bank loses money it's because it's been hacked and that has happened, it's not the end of the world. But we may well see, for all the reasons that were spelled out, you know, uh, a major attack that has kinetic consequences, where something happens and lives are lost and real fortunes are also lost. And I think that's something we, as citizens, have to worry about because there are these inherent vulnerabilities. And if they're not addressed, we will see the equivalent of sort of a stock market crash of the 20s when it comes to the internet, where there, there are major catastrophic consequences. So we, we are at a, a tipping point. We talk about this in the book. We are at a tipping point, and people will take themselves offline if they don't trust the technology. This entire edifice is built on trust. And that's one of our central themes, right? When you go online, you trust the technology. You trust that the person you're communicating with is there, right? 
If you didn't, you wouldn't use it. If you didn't trust online banking, you wouldn't do it. And I think, you know, that's something that is very fragile in the internet ecosystem. And it's one of the reasons why when it comes to, you know, fundamental security online, we got to take it seriously. We got to invest in it. We're not investing to the degree that we should. You know, encryption is not a panacea. I mean, Neil talked about that. It's not a panacea. You know, what's encrypted today can be broken tomorrow. And that's true even of block, some of the blockchain technologies. I'm going to let, uh, because we're at the witching hour, each one of our panelists to offer some final observations. I've already offered mine. It's actually a subtle pitch to uh, go out and buy the book that's available on sale <laughs> outside. Uh, you're no, under no obligation to do so, but we would welcome it. And my CG colleague and the publisher who's here, I'd like to recognize her, Carol uh, Bonnet, who's our publisher, who did a wonderful job, uh, you know, producing a book that is, uh, is not just interesting, and accessible, but also uh, highly readable uh, due to her superb uh, editorial skills. So, Carol, thank you. Um, final yeah. words. So Keep I'll, it short. You know, I'll, I'll pick up on that, that last comment, but, but summarize it that I made. Uh, I'm actually quite hopeful. Uh, I think the Internet's been great for mankind, uh, for humans. Um, it, it, it really is a great, great tool, um, but it has a lot of evolution left in it. Um, and I think it, we're still very early. And, and the only kind of thing I hope for it is that it manifests the best um, in values that humans have. Um, it isn't just about technical capabilities. That, that's where we're going to go down this dystopian road. Jay. Security is a deterrent. Uh, it's a speed bump. But, you know, 100% security is 100% impossible. So we always like to use, you know, North America, the two men and the bear, or the two men and the tiger in Asia. You just have to be faster than the other guy not the bear. So <laughs> if, you, if you throw up some basic defenses, uh, you'll be better than the easier prey, and that, that will serve you well. And, and the whole industry just keeps doing this. I think my, my final thought might sort of might hinge on some of the ambiguity sort of raised in that last question. There seems to be contending worlds that we're kind of facing here. And a part of it's because I don't think we really know that the pace of technological change that we're dealing with is very fast, and it's also accelerating. And so our ability to sort of call the putt for five years down the road is got a pretty wide sort of margin for error that, for all we know, it could be a fundamentally different technology. We're already seeing sort of advances in AI and things like this online that are fundamentally changing some of the natures of digital interactions. And so um, one of the things, and this sort of returns to something that Fen said, I think is, up to this point, we've sort of let the system emerge organically as it will, and we haven't really thought about sort of trying to manage the ebbs and flows because we're still sort of in a proof of concept phase. And we're getting into a stage now where the concept of the Internet's been proven, and now we really need to focus on, well, what kind of world do we want to try to live in and try to shape sort of governance outcomes so that we can actually produce something that is inherently livable for as many of us as possible. Thank you, Eric. I think that's a splendid note to uh, end our evening on. Uh, you've been a terrific uh, and attentive audience. Uh, please join me in thanking my fellow co-panelists uh, for this evening. Thank you. So it, um, it falls to me to, uh, to sum up the evening and to, and to thank our, our distinguished panel. And it's, a, it's an interesting job. I suppose to sum up the evening, I'm probably going to go home and cry myself to sleep. No, all joking aside, uh, when I think about the essence of what I've heard tonight, number one, the technology is evolving and it's outstripping our ability to govern it by a factor of about 100. Uh, number two is that the technology mirrors humanity, both the best and the worst. If it's a, it can be a force for good or a force for evil in the world. Um, and number three, and this is probably the biggest one, is that um, I really hope that the good guys win, and you're seeing them up here. Uh, we have Neil Desai, who's working for one of the one of the uh, the fastest growing technology companies. That's a force for good. When you hear about those children being exploited on the internet, it's his job to stop them. 
J, J. Paul Hines, he's out there trying to protect our financial networks to make sure that the bad guys don't get the money. And Eric and Fenn are turning their minds to the, what I think is the public policy challenge of a generation. And they're trying to help us articulate a governance framework that can, can make sure that the good guys win. A couple of, uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, notes. Um, uh, Al Gore, has, any, has anyone heard of Al Gore before? Denny, would anyone like to hear him speak? <laughs> Me too. Um, would anyone like to, to see his new movie? That's more like it. Uh, his, we're going to be screening Al Gore's new movie, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power, here on March 6th, so we hope to see you then. Also, our next series in this, uh, in this speaker series will be on March 21st, and we'll be dealing with climate change and geoengineering. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard of geoengineering, but at base, what it is is trying to apply technology to fix climate change, to actually engineer the environment. The, the premise is that we can't do enough to stop uh, carbon, that, that we have to actually start fiddling with the, uh, with the engineering around climate. So we have to release bacteria into the ozone to eat carbon and all these types of things. So it's an advanced technology meets uh, climate change policy. That'll be Neil Craig and uh, Tamia Abda uh, uh, Janetti. So, um, so to close out the evening, I'd like to ask you to help me thanking a distinguished panel for a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.